welcome to the PlayStation Podcast, your place for all things ceramic, here with Sean Jackson, your host, and today we have an awesome guest, Sivir McDonald. Sivir McDonald, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for having me, as they say on 7.30. <laughs> I was actually Good hoping... Good to be with you. I, I, was, I was hoping our times would be the, um, the same time. Um, I had to double check exactly where your studio location is. <laughs> I'm in uh, the Shire of Byron on the east coast of Australia in northern New South Wales. Yeah, I just, I just uh, saw just before that you're not far from Byron Bay. Yeah, well, Byron's about uh, 15, 20 minutes down towards the coast. Mullumbimby, which is my hometown, is yeah, just inland, but it's the it's the kind of capital of Byron Shire. It's where the council chambers are and all the admin happens. But, but uh, as they say, Byron Bay is the jewel in the crown. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, it's, it's the tourist hotspot, you know, but it's very crowded these days. It's a very busy place. Yeah, uh, my brother. The locals of uh, many years ago, we kind of retired, retreated to Mullumbimby in the hills. My brother I've been was a here for 30 there. years now. Sorry? My brother was a big surfer up there for many years. Oh, yeah, well, it's a good surf spot. Yeah. Lots of surfing up here. And really good surf culture. Many, many uh, champions amongst them. So, yeah, Byron's uh, famous for that. So, um, but it's also getting famous for ceramics, I've got to say. Yeah, there, there is a... um. There's a big uh, sculpture prize up there, isn't there? Um, there is. There's. There was one on the beach a few times, a couple of years, a few years ago. But there's one at Brunswick Heads called the Brunswick Nature Sculpture Walk, and that's happening again this year. And there'll be ceramics in that, but it's a more generally a sculpture prize and award with a bit of a focus on. Um, ephemeral and nature-based works, environmental themes, so that sort of, that sort of orientation. The other um, big sculpture award that's in this area is up actually on the, in Queensland over the water at Corumban, and that's held every year too. Oh, nice, nice. So you're, you're based in Mullumbimby. Uh, how many potters are around there at, are at, this, at this time? Uh, well, I've, uh, I've got to say I've lost count. There's a lot. <laughs> and uh, I'd say just in the town of Mullum, there's probably at least 10 or 15. Um, I work with, an, with a group of professional potters called North Coast Ceramics, and we have organised in the past the North Coast Mud Trail. So that was an offshoot from the open studio event uh, staged by the Australian Ceramics. Association, yes, and um, yeah, as a as a promotional medium, we established the Mud Trail as our local uh, version of that open studio, and that's been that's gone off. That's just been so successful that nobody could have possibly anticipated it. Well, the event, you know, the open studio is in its tenth year now. And this year, Australian Ceramics Association have chosen to um, re change the timing. So it's going to be in November. But we found that uh, the event happens much more successfully in August up here. And um, we'll probably proceed with the mud trail in, in August again. It's the time of year when it's a bit cooler. People are much more likely to want to get in their cars and drive around from studio to studio and enjoy the beautiful countryside that, uh, that this place is. And um, yeah, it's just a, a more um, suitable time for us. But I do understand uh, Straight Tucker uh, changing the date because for people down south, it's pretty cold in August and people aren't so inclined to want to get in their car and driving around. So um, the, the November date for, for that will be probably much more suitable for them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hopefully, it uh, sounds good. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to get to that next one. Uh, I didn't realize there were so many potters up there. 
Yeah, there's a lot of potters up here, and um, but they're not all part of the mud trail. And uh, there's look, you know, Lismore Tape has been a stronghold of pottery education for many, many years. Um, I started my pottery education almost started it there. My, my formal education I started at Lismore Tape in 1991, and uh, spent five years. There and then did a, a master's degree at Southern Cross University. So in those days, in the 70s, there was a, um, a really strong educational support for people wanting to study pottery and ceramics in general uh, in this region. And um, Southern Cross University hasn't got so much, so much of it now, but still uh, there's more tape. And also uh, the, the tape at Mo Willemba, have, have got uh, ceramics education. There are kilns and wheels and, and good teachers. So, you know, that kind of has sustained a, a steady output of, uh, of potters and well-educated, informed people for, that have stayed in the region and really strengthened the discipline and uh, the culture of ceramics here. Do you do any training at your uh, studio yourself? Because uh, uh, with the wood firing, there's a, there's a lot of uh, community practice with um, packing and uh, doing um, kiln shifts. Yeah, well, I was I did a lot of teaching, institutional teaching for many years, but uh, in the last few years, I've decided uh, that there are many other people who are able to. to take on that level. And what, what was missing, especially in the institutional sense, was the, the lack of wood fire and, and real kind of kiln technology. So that, that has been rationalized out of the, out of the curricula. So um, I've, I built up my Anagama about eight, six or eight years ago up in, in my previous home up at Goomingeri. And uh, ever since that, I built that kiln, people were coming around wanting thirsty for that sort of experience and that sort of knowledge. So it's been, um, I kind of realized at the time, it wasn't necessarily my intention. I wanted to return to my, my real passion in ceramics, which is wood firing and built the kiln. And then the kiln attracted the people. And in the last year or so, um, my partner and I moved down into town to make our lives a little bit easier. We had a, a pretty rugged life up there. It was very beautiful, you know, in the, in the rainforest, uh, but the property was quite high maintenance. So I've actually, it was a part of a, a, a community and I've had, so far I've had the grace of the community to uh, maintain access to the kiln. So pretty soon in the next few weeks we'll be firing again, even though I don't live up there anymore. So. We go up there, my crew and I go up there and stack wood uh, once a week. And uh, when we're ready to fire, we start packing, which is what's happening now. Awesome, awesome. Your like, background, um, I want to know more about your, your background because uh, you're at a very, um, very professional position at the moment. And a lot of people want to know like, um, like how people get started, uh, where they get their training from and that sort of stuff. So where did all this um, interest in ceramics or pottery, uh, where did that all spark from? Like before you even touched clay, how were you introduced into ceramics? Uh, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, my, my, uh, my early education was in business. And uh, I very, uh, I very quickly realised that that was not to be my career path, and I came to this area in the early seventies and explored um, the lifestyles that were being, you know. And after a while, I, I decided that I didn't want to do that, but I didn't really want to do business. And, actually, and um, I discovered that my, I had a real love of theatre. And I trained as a dancer and explored theatre and produced uh, fringe theatre productions for a good 10, 15 years. And 
I think in that time, I was very much uh, self-taught in the production areas, like the, the dance training I had, but all the production and design of sets and props and masks and so forth, I taught myself. And I think that was um, very fun foundational to my ability to work in three-dimensional objects. So that um, at some point I, I was, at the, I had a, a kind of a, a, a realization that I couldn't keep dancing at the way I was at the age of 40 something. So I'm sure um, you can keep going with it. Anyway, I, I was caught with a pocket full of the sacred sacrament uh, MDMA and uh, was escorted to, as a guest of Her Majesty to a country institution and uh, discovered pottery there with a fantastic teacher who came in one day a week. And he told me that he thought I should, I could easily be a, a career potter. He thought, not necessarily production potter, but uh, my ingenuity and creativity lent itself to pr producing clay objects in a way that uh, I could sustain myself. And he said, but you'll have to go to, you'll have to go and study. So when I was released, I was already booked into Lismore TAFE and he, he did it all for me, had it all sorted out because he was a, a TAFE teacher himself. And uh, I came back up here and um, went to TAFE and started there. So I did five years at TAFE, did the diploma and a couple of years uh, post diploma where we were able to build kilns and um, really explore kiln technology, mostly wood firing in those days. For me, that was my orientation, my passion. And then at some point I realized that uh, the, the offering at Southern Cross University, which was very close by under a man called Tony and Curtis was there. And because I had a graduate of the business degree and a diploma in ceramics, I was eligible to end of the postgraduate program up there. So I applied and was successful and I studied with Tony for three years. So he was the one who kind of showed, I had a, I had a lot of wild ideas and a bit of technique, but Tony instilled the rigor that's really required for, um, I think a successful, or in my case anyway, a successful career in ceramics. So I graduated from Southern Cross University as a, uh, with my MA in 2000. So that's been 21 years ago that I've been uh, practicing with that sort of backing. And, you know, I came out of university and, and really I was ready to sort of solve, solve my problems, but I certainly had a few <laughs> in terms of, you know, technical stuff to work out. And I couldn't build a kiln straight away. I uh, certainly didn't have the resources, even though I had the space. But, uh, you know, building a wood kiln is uh, something that you do slowly. I had built them during my research at the university. I built kilns there and at the tape. But building my own kiln didn't come till much later. So for quite a few years at, up, in the, up in the forest, I was working just with my gas kiln and exploring forms the forms and the, and the surfaces that, that I was able to, with reduction glazes. And um, yeah, it was a, a pretty fascinating time. I think, you know, I, my business degree was in marketing and uh, one of the things in marketing is that, first of all, you've got to have a good product. And I think I took about 10 years to develop my product, you know, which was, and at the same time, I was developing all the promotional stuff, making a name, doing a lot of teaching at the community college. I did a bit of teaching at the university for a while at some of the tapes, but I never had a job, like a real full-time tenured um, academic position. I don't think I'm really suitable for that. I think that, uh, um, um, I think taking the time, as you, as you were just saying, taking the time to develop uh, one's foundational knowledge or uh, learning how to develop something of quality in order to sell or produce to, to offer up. I think at investing that time, you know, it's for 10 years, as you're saying, uh, I think that's a very key element of, of um, foundational success in pottery and ceramics. I think it's something a lot of people overlook. 
Well, and also it was at a time when uh, ceramics, I think, was in a kind of a trough. You know, ceramics had a had a high time in the 70s and 80s in Australia, and then in the 90s, which is kind of when I started, it was at the end of the tail of that, and it went down. And you know, in the early early 21st century, you had people like Jamie Oliver plating up meals saying white's good, you know, white's, I always like white. And so everybody wanted white plates. So pottery wasn't that kind of popular, you know, so it was um, in a way conducive to for, for somebody who was passionate about the work to be producing the work and definitely having some customers and, and uh, some loyal fans who would, you know, I'd had my open studio events way back then before Hacker was doing them. And even though I was way out of the way, it was a 20 minute drive from town on my open studios, I'd get three or 400 people on the weekend. So there were pottery lovers around, but not like there is today. And um, I, I do think that there's a lot of people coming out of, out of the institutions these days who, you know, have only got the rudiments, but, but they're being, um, met with great demand. So they're very fortunate really in terms of being able to really produce the work. Do you feel that it's important to follow or study about what's trending around or do you feel it's more important to stick to one particular niche and just keep chipping and working on that? Well, there's certainly a virtue in that, Sean. Um, but it's not something I've done. <laughs> I've I've tried everything, you know. And in, in that year, in those years of the of the nineties and the um, early twenty first century, when there, I had to kind of do whatever I could do to stay alive. And I developed other forms of sculpture as well, metal and wood, and um, playing in that arena where there was kind of general acceptance. Sculpture sculpture never died. It was ceramics that was having a low time. But, um, you, you know, I had to, I was very inventive and um, I, I turned my hand to lots of, lots of different things. So I was producing tableware, but I was exploring sculpture. And I also had a, a, quite a time where I explored uh, wall mounted landscapes because I think there was a, a time Time and I thought, oh, people don't know what to do with it. You know, I'd have it. People would walk in and go, oh, I really like that, but I, what, what am I going to do with it? You know, they didn't really know what to, it's changed now, you know, that sort of a comment now is really an archaic sort of response, but mm. there was a time when people would say that, and I thought, well, you know, it's easy to sell painting, so I'm going to find some, a, a, something to do on the walls, and I developed these landscapes, which were pretty much... Um, a product of uh, studying the Australian landscape, but also the Australian landscape painters. You know, so the classic, the golden era of of, land, of, of painting in Australia, the you know, late eighteenth, eighteenth, nineteenth century, where the uh, where they were those early painters, um, Patrick McCubbin and those guys, they were going out and camping and painting. You know, they were so dedicated and their early explorations in the Australian landscape set a, set a tone. What, one thing I like about so your that work. Thing I was doing, and I was actually abstracted from that eventually. And that was a very su successful form of work for me. And it kept on going, you know, probably kept me going for, probably for 10 or 12 years. And I still do them occasionally. I, I especially get uh, very inspired when I walk. I love walking in the bush. And uh, a lot of my inspiration comes from that. So my sculpture these days is very much orientated to rocks. I, um, I, I can be endlessly fascinated with the forms that come through this process called weathering, which is an ongoing thing. You know, and actually it's out of weathering that clay emerges. Clay comes from weathered rock and um, it fascinates me. And also the energy of rock, you know, just that you can actually see this substance that's been there for just millions and millions of years. Uh, primeval substance, inanimate, but, um, but so powerful. 
and very inspirational for me. Your work has a very strong architectural element to it. Where does that, uh, that element come from? Well, I think that's uh, partly to do with uh, my early, early explorations at TAFE. One of my teachers there was this guy called Dennis Muntz, who is a bit of a legend in this part of the world, for those who have explored him. Uh, and um, he was getting us into these constructions or I responded to that, that introduction and um, the, the constructed slab forms was something that I started then and I've been doing ever since. So that when I was working into the, the medium of um, landscape and I started bringing the landscapes back out off the wall, then the slab constructions and the, the landscape imagery started to merge. So my abstraction from the, from the rock forms that inspire me come from these faceted architectonic slab constructions. And I find um, I, I'm not a designer really in terms of, I don't sort of design that well uh, prior to the uh, to the commencement of my work, I'm, I'm uh, often designing on the run and I set myself like little problems in the production of the work and all sorts of un unexpected and surprising outcomes come from that, just from that on the spot problem solving of how can I address this uh, interval or be between the slabs how can these, how can, how can that be interesting? Mm. And, you know, if you look at the top of a mountain, there's all sorts of bizarre sort of formations there that have been the, the kind of haphazard uh, result of weathering. And I think that, that problem solving is, there's in a st some degree emulates that. Uh, with your work, um, there's a very strong, uh, even though it's it's clearly got a lot of Australian elements to it, there's a very strong uh, influence of uh, uh, foreign inf influences uh, in ceramics. I won't say where, but um, have you had any uh, travel overseas or influence or training overseas at all? Um, you know, I think, you know, I haven't traveled very much, actually. I traveled much more before I started ceramics, but I have been in Japan, but I, that was quite recent, relatively recent. But the thing that uh, we've had in Australia is that the world's traveled to us. We've had this fabulous festival called Galgong, <laughs> uh, you know, every three years. And there's also been the Woodfire Conferences and the National Con you know, there was a conference every year for a long, long time. And now sometimes there's even two. Um, I know it's all taken a bit of a uh, hiatus since COVID ended the picture, but, but uh, Goldwong's not gonna go away. And I think there was um, tremendous inspiration came from the international potters and artists who visited Australia then. And I think, um, I think that I was in second year at TAFE when, when the first gold bomb happened, when we all went in a big bus and uh, were there for the whole week camp. And it was, in those days, it was camping out on Janet Mansfield's property. And there were these fantastic artists from Japan and everywhere uh, who were demonstrating and mixing with us and partying and you know, and at night you'd be drinking around the campfire and in the daytime they'd be just producing these fabulous works. And it was a very intimate sort of setting, you know, where you could be really right up close. Then they'd be, all the kilns are going off. So this was a tremendously uh, inspiring time. And, um, you know, it, was, it wasn't necessary to travel in a way. We had these first-hand experiences um, with international practice uh, just by going to Goldwyn. And I went to, I think, I've been to most of them. 
but um, I've missed a couple, two or three maybe over over 30 years. So I've had, I've been quite spoiled in that respect. Oh, that's good. Uh, it's I've, good for a lot Korea, of young people to know I that. Went to a, I had a tour of Korea with uh, an international group and at the, uh, as a guest of the Korean government. And we had a, a, an exhibition at the uh, Celadon Festival in Nangjin, Gangjin, which is in the south of Korea. So that was an incredible treat. I remember uh, you, I had to get myself over there. I, I, from the moment I stepped off the plane, I was taken care of. It was phenomenal. I'd never experienced anything like it. There was somebody to meet us at the airport. They took us in a bus to the hotel and everything was taken, which was pretty fortunate really because none of us could speak Korean. Uh, and then we were uh, at the festival for five days seeing this phenomenal amount of salad and, and historical work. There's, in Korea, there are nine museums, national museums, the size of, you know, a, a museum, uh, that are just dedicated to ceramics. And uh, in, in um, Gangjin, there was, this is the Celadon Museum, but there were five huge buildings exhibiting Celadon work. It's, you know, it, it's just beyond belief for, for us really to think that there's so much uh, importance granted to ceramics when they have a, a 9,000 year history in that country. And ceramics, uh, you know, it's a very, very highly revered and special uh, discipline. How's everything going for you, uh, like um, uh, mid and post COVID? Has it uh, influenced your practice or your business side of things? Uh, well, I've had a unique um, experience of COVID because the, the day before lockdown is the day we moved house. So we landed in this new house and um, with all the boxes and <laughs> it was about setting up new. But the first thing I set up was this, this gallery that I'm in right now and then I can sort of show, show you around. Oh, nice. This is my showroom. There's, there's, there's the, a landscape up there. But, um, and, and then I had to, um, also build a studio for his kids. So I thought um, this is where I'm going to build my workshop. So during COVID, I was building a workshop, which is now complete. Oh, no, it's never, it'll never. But it's got enough for me to be operational. So I'm producing work again. And um, uh, COVID has been uh, really good. I think I'm, I'm, I'm well known enough that people come now. And there's some people, you know, I don't, it's not a busy gallery or any, by any means, but I've got a few good clients and some of them were very patient waiting for me to get set up. Um, and, and I'm producing work for them now. I've got a couple of restaurants and um, a shop in Sydney and they make big orders. So I'm very fortunate in that respect. But the other thing was that the mud trail, the mud trail, um, sorry, I'm losing you. Yeah, the mud trail uh, was, went ahead this this year, last year, even when TACA decided to postpone it. And we were on this kind of knife edge. Um, our local councils were saying, you, your event can go ahead. And uh, TACA had pulled the plug on it and put it back till November. Uh, and we were really nervous about going ahead, but decided to, to risk it. And then everybody in this area was so starved for stuff to do that we just had this, this avalanche of people come through our studios. I had somebody, a young man on the gate taking phone numbers of, of the parties when they arrived, which was the protocol for COVID safe practice. You had to record all your guests. 
and uh, there were 350 on the list that came through my front gate. But I asked the, the young uh, helper, I said, how many people were in each party? He said, oh, between two and four. So if there's three, it's nearly a thousand people came through the studio in the one weekend. So uh, that was a, you know, a, a huge weekend. So COVID's been pretty good for me, really. Oh, well, that's and, good. That's uh, good to hear. <laughs> and I, I must say that up here, it's we're in a bubble, really. We haven't been affected. There's been no cases. It's all business as usual, really. And um, there's school. The um, school holidays. It gets very busy. Byron Bay's goes completely crazy, but even Mullumbimby is very busy. Uh, anybody who's involved in watching the property market knows that there's been a surge of interest in regional properties. Property values up here have gone up 40%. It's, it's, uh, it's crazy. And, you know, I thought I'd move to town, but it's almost like Mullumbimby is almost like a, suburb, a city suburb now. It's very busy all, almost all the time. I think so there's uh, been a radical change. Hmm. I, I think with the uh, post COVID, there's a huge mm. movement um, into lifestyle. There's a lifestyle movement developing uh, where people are all getting off their couches and getting out, wanting to get outdoors. And I think that's a huge opportunity for the ceramics industry as people want to get involved in uh, the crafts. They want to get involved uh, in stuff like ceramics. Uh, I think it's a huge opportunity for people. Uh, if people were wanting, um, developed a huge interest in ceramics or pottery and they wanted to, say, get into pottery full-time or become a full-time potter, uh, what, what sort of advice would you give them if, if someone was dreaming of doing that? Oh. Would you tell them to run away? Well, I, you know, you need to make sure you're ready. No, I wouldn't say run away, but I'd say make sure you're ready. Mm. And um, it's fun with clay. Even though the, the, um, the hypnotic and um, calming effects of being on the wheel won't, will always be there. There's a lot of other work too, right? Um, operating your kilns, maintaining your kilns, keeping your, keeping your clay supplies, running the business. There's a lot to it. And um, yeah, you've just got to make sure you're ready. So make sure you're, you're really across all the different tasks that, that, first of all, being a potter involves, and secondly, running a business. Hmm. But certainly there's uh, no lack of interest out there these days. And I see people coming out of college and being, you know, fairly at certain things and having a lot of uh, dynamic and drive. They'll, and they go for it. And they're... Um, it's not a lost cause or anything they're actually getting somewhere. But it's not an easy, you've really got to be ready. You've got to have a, a work ethic. And I really think it's important to be feel that you are ready for it. So um, serving a, uh, I mean, no all the, all the stuff to take is good, but probably serving uh, some sort of apprenticeship or uh, mentorship would be a good place. Do you feel there are people who are actually one of my one of my local people who come around quite a bit and they're just learning from her so they're doing hands-on stuff right from the beginning i don't know when they'll be ready but i know they're extremely keen do, do you feel that um uh working in clay for so long uh, do you feel that it has taught you any life lessons that you could share? Um, one thing 
I'm, I definitely think working with Clay has taught me his patience. And um, I blew up a few pots the other day. I put my uh, new electric, I haven't had electric kiln before I moved here. And I've had, got this new electric kiln. And, uh, you know, I'm kind of working at okay, but I thought, oh yeah, these pots, they're not quite dry. I'll put them in and uh, put them on a, a four hour slow start, 20 degrees an hour. I came back the next day and the kiln had turned itself off miraculously. And there was all these, uh, probably about, I'd lost about four or five pieces. And I went, yeah, I haven't done that for a long time. So, and it was like, I went, okay, yeah, I'm being impatient, you know, and there the, that was kind of a little catch up lesson on patience, trying to push, push the clay. It's, uh, it's better to just wait, mm. be able to, Just, yeah. It definitely Wait teaches a lot results. of patience. Sorry, I missed that. It, for me, I feel Clay wow. definitely teaches us a lot of patience. Yep. The Clay is a great, um, a great teacher in that. Okay. Uh, I won't take up too much of your time. Um, I know you got the light uh, is shining in your eye, so I don't want to um, cause you any more trouble. <laughs> and I, I do appreciate. I'll cut things short today. I, I do appreciate your time. Thank you, Severa, so much for coming on the podcast today and for having having a yarn with me. Thank you, Sean. It's been Awesome. Our connection doesn't seem to be very good at this time, so we'll cut we'll cut things there. Uh, I hope things continue to go well for you. Uh, we'll definitely continue to stay in contact, and I hope that I can um, come up soon, hopefully in November, and uh, check out your studio and a whole bunch of other potters and see how things are rolling up there in Mullumbimby. Yeah, welcome. Yeah, do call. Awesome. Call in. Yeah, love to see you. Awesome. All the best. Okay, cheers. Thank you. For, thank you for coming on the show. Right. Big announcement is that we have from yesterday, we've been approved on Apple Podcasts. So you can also find us on Apple Podcasts as well as Spotify and Anchor and uh, a few other smaller podcast stations as well. But it's great news to have our podcast on a large networks such as apple podcasts we will see you next week on the clay station podcast i'm sean jackson have a good one cheers